Hello, and welcome to lecture 14 of AMAT 502 at UAlbany. Today, we're going to continue our introduction to machine learning by looking at classification. The topics for today are we're going to first recap some of the paradigm for machine learning that we outlined in last lecture, which was summarized from Guttag's Introduction to Computation and Programming Using Python. Uh, this train model predict paradigm is going to be our framework for thinking about all machine learning algorithms, although with some exceptions as we get a little later in the course. The key thing here is we're going to now look at classification, which is based on features. Um, and we're going to, again, take a visit back into the past by looking at Aristotle's initial attempts at classification and providing taxonomy. We'll then step forward to the modern era, where we look at classification on the internet and provide a quick remark on how classic machine learning methods differ from deep learning. This all sets us up for an overview of machine learning with a focus on classification. We'll talk about linear classifiers, <clears throat> the 80-20% test train split, what it means to evaluate the accuracy of a classifier, along with our next algorithm for classification, which will be k-nearest neighbors, which requires the notion of a metric space. This allows us to then depart from Aristotle as we look at classification for the iris data set and a focus on variation as very beautifully described by Darwin. All right, so as a quick recap, we put aside some of the more philosophical considerations of how is learning possible? We instead focus on three components of learning, which we'll just agree on for this course. First is that we need to train from observed data. This is a perception, as indicated as one of the pramanas or proofs um, in Samkin philosophy in last lecture. The second component of learning is going to be model selection, which is the basis for inference. Here you're trying to pick a model that you think well describes the data you observed so that you can eventually accomplish step three, which is prediction. Now, while your predictions are wrong, Built inside of model selection is a third sort of while loop, which causes us to upgrade our model so that we can tune our parameters to hopefully predict better and better with increasing accuracy. In order to assess this quality, remember we needed to first identify what are the parameters that described our model. And then we needed a penalty or objective function, which allowed us to optimize against and steers us towards better parameters for describing the data. That all goes into methods which usually are grounded in calculus, but we'll see uh, instances where that's not true as well. So as a reminder, we illustrated these basic principles of train, model, and predict using regression, which was our way of sort of analyzing functional relationships in data. So the very first step in classification is perception. And so we already have a problem. What features are useful when we're trying to classify things? For example, if we're attempting to classify animals as if we're a biologist or zoologist, it's probably not useful to subjectively assess whether or not an animal is cute or not. We're trying to somehow identify objective features um, that help carve the universe at its joints. I'd like you all to think about, are there situations where reporting subjective preferences is actually useful for learning? Well, this is certainly the case with most modern applications of machine learning, meaning we're often interested in seeing what do people prefer in terms of products so that we can market them better to them. So this is really the underlying reason why so many things like uh, Netflix or even TikTok is so valuable is that it's providing a re rich source for mining people's preferences, which then allows them to market um, and train better advertisement, which is ultimately how revenue is generated for a lot of these platforms. So before we get to that, let's step back in time and look at one of the first attempts at classification as pioneered by Aristotle. So if you remember from last lecture, I introduced Plato, who was a student of Socrates, and gave us this relatively odd notion of whether or not learning was possible. And in fact, he concluded that all learning was an act of memory. Aristotle 
departed and was a lot more grounded in what you might call science. He was interested in observing what is actually out in the world and trying to draw inferences from that. Indeed, in this famous uh, depiction of Plato, who's on the left next to Aristotle, you can see a situation in which so you can see a situation in which um, Plato is gesturing up towards the heavens in a remark on geometry, and and Aristotle is interested in gesturing at what is around in the world. And you'll notice that he's carrying his book of Nicomanthean, Nicomanchean ethics. Um, in that sense, Aristotle was much more interested in what was happening down in the world and less interested in the more sort of theolo theological considerations that we took up last time. So Aristotle was in some sense one of the first scientists. Um, and in particular, he was interested in classifying even just basic animals. And he used a, a sort of taxonomy which was based on certain attributes but I'll ask you to think of these attributes as features. Uh, and these features that Aristotle deemed useful were questions such as, when an animal gives birth, does it give live birth or does it lay eggs? Um, and in particular, what is the gestation period? Um, another question that Aristotle used to classify animals is, does it have legs? And if so, how many? A broader sort of uh, binary categorization was, is the animal invertebrate or vertebrate, meaning does it have a spine or not, or internal skeleton? And then again, more speculatively, Aristotle chose to classify animals based on what type of soul they had. Um, and for, for him, there were three sort of types of soul. There was vegetative, so he concluded that plants do have souls, but they're different from animal souls, which he described as sensitive, which are in turn different from human souls, which he viewed as being rational. Aristotle, like many, thought that humans were the only creatures capable of rational thinking. There's additionally the question of what are the qualities of this animal? Um, hot or cold, you might think of this in terms of blood. Uh, hot or cold blooded. Or wet or dry, so is this something that lives in the ocean or does it live on land? So I want you to notice that these features have different sort of qualities to them. Um, some of these are categorical, meaning that they are discrete, such as you know, vertebrate or invertebrate. But others are numerical, um, such as the length of the gestation period and the number of legs. So it's going to be important when we think about our featureization of data. Are we looking at attributes or features which are numerical in nature, or are they categorical in nature, such as Democrat or Republican? So the reason why we need features is that we're gonna use this to then create a pipeline, which allows us to go from samples or observations all the way down to labels. And labeling is gonna be really the key aspect of, of classification. I wanna label certain animals to be of a certain species or genera. Um, there I'm giving them a label. So let's go ahead and look at some um, simple examples of this. So, Suppose I pre-specified my, my samples and pre-specified my label set. Question is, how would you piece together features to decide what animal deserves what label? So for example, if I had a, an orangutan, a human, a kangaroo, a blue whale, a pelican, a sparrow, a bat, an iguana, or a king cobra, and I was trying to assign every element of that set one of the labels, mammal, bird, or reptile, what might be some of the distinguishing features that I use to discern whether or not one species belongs to one label or another? So take a moment to think about this. And in particular, I want you to go back and think about Aristotle's features, which he used. So we generally think of birds as uh, laying eggs. So looking back, you can see that the feature of what type of birth, is it live or is it an egg-based birth, uh, might be one way of discriminating each of these. But there are also some examples where it's a little murky of what the difference is between, let's say, a mammal and a bird. So for example, uh, bats are actually mammals. Um, 
and they don't lay eggs like normal birds do. So a pelican and a sparrow would be examples of a bird, but a bat would not, which is interesting because they both fly and seem to have very similar attributes or features. So keep pondering and think about each of these examples and what of Ar which ones of Aristotle's features would allow you to discern one type or another. Another unusual to think about is a blue whale. So that's something that's of a, of a wet quality, uh, but is also a mammal. And so you might ask, what is it that a blue whale and a bat have in common? Which means that they belong to the same class of mammal. And remember, this class also includes things like orangutans and humans, but doesn't include things like cobras. And in fact, in this sense, cobras and pelicans and sparrows are more similar in the fact that they use eggs in order to reproduce. All this is supposed to show to you how complicated the task of classification can be. And so I hope you try to think of these borderline cases because ultimately when we're developing our machine learning algorithms, we're trying to carve out decision boundaries which allow us to separate certain classes from other ones. So we're gonna go ahead and now look at a more modern example of this. And I like to phrase this as Aristotle meet the internet. So for example, a very common classification task in machine learning is to take pictures and determine is the picture, can, does the picture contain a representation of a cat or a dog? So let's try to dive into that a little more deeply. In particular, in trying to assess the difference between cats and dogs, what features would you use to try to teach a computer to discriminate the difference between dogs and cats? Perhaps you think about the shape of the mouth or the nose, or the fact that a cat has sort of pointy ears. But some dogs also have pointy ears, such as German Shepherds. Again, all of these are sort of complicated featureization tasks, and one of the hot topics in machine learning concerns feature engineering. So, one of the things I just want you to be aware of, because those of you who are in this class may have heard some of the broader news around machine learning. And in particular, may have heard some things called deep learning or neural networks. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a quick comment on this. So first of all, if you think carefully about the cat and dog example, or even the one where I had the set of different animals, and I asked you to try to figure out what features allow you to decide what class label belongs to each mammal, reptile, or bird. This is actually one of the critical differences between classical machine learning methods and deep learning methods. So normally, in traditional machine learning, you go from some sort of set of samples, which is your input, you decide and specifically engineer what features you're going to use in order to try to separate into classes. So this sort of goes underneath feature extraction and goes into what you ultimately want to learn on, which are the features. And then given those features, you're going to apply one of these traditional machine learning algorithms that I'll describe to you throughout this course in order to decide the output. The difference between traditional machine learning and deep learning is that these three steps are all put inside of one black box. And in fact, one of the really beautiful things about neural nets is that it allows us to, it allows the computer, I should say, to automatically extract features which are relevant for classification tasks. And it often comes up with its own unique set of decision boundaries, and then just keeps optimizing whatever function it's trying to optimize, usually accuracy, in order to carve out better and better distinctions. Of course, one of the big problems there is that it's hard to explain to a human what a deep learning algorithm is doing. In particular, the biggest problem with deep learning is explainability. Previously, all previous attempts of classification, there was clearly defined features which allowed you to separate data of certain types. But now with deep learning, we don't even know what the computer is using in order to carve out these boundaries, which often makes it vulnerable to certain adversarial attacks. But that said, 
deep learning has had remarkable success and has been able to classify and outperform traditional machine learning methods um, by 10 and 20 percent. All right, so I've alluded already to some of these traditional machine learning methods, but let me go ahead and give you the sort of tree of learning. Broadly speaking, machine learning is divided into the following categories or subjects. The first two main hierarchies are supervised versus unsupervised learning. Supervised learning assumes that we're dealing with labeled data. So I've already provided the computer with some instances of pictures of cats and dogs. And that is what the algorithm uses to train on. We think of this as a, a set of a feature vector, which is how we're representing our sample in the computer, along with its pre-decided label value. The task of learning is then very simple. We want to try to take a new feature vector, which we've associated to a new instance, and then correctly predict the label value. Supervised learning is generally divided into two further subcategories. We already saw the first one, and this is regression. The difference between regression and classification is that regression is interested in predicting a label which is continuously varying. So for example, you might think of this as uh, the height or weight where I've given other features, uh, such as the reverse one. For example, if I wanna predict someone's weight, I might tell you their height, and that is their feature. And then from their, that feature, you're gonna try to predict their weight. Classification, on the other hand, is interested in situations where you have discrete, I'll argue, finitely many possible labels, such as, is this a mammal or a bird or a reptile? Notice there's no sort of continuous interpolation between mammal, bird, and reptile. Whereas in regression, there are continuous interpolations between people of different weights. Unsupervised learning is in some sense much more interesting and also much harder because we're not given data with labels. In fact, we are just given a bunch of samples represented in the computer using their feature vectors and then from that, we're trying to infer what we call latent structure in the data. Latent means hidden. But essentially, this is the structure which we believe the universe naturally falls into, which would exist as a division without us humans deciding what categories these instances belong in. So let's hear, here's an example of a latent variable. So whenever someone applies to college, or when you apply to this graduate program, Ultimately, what's happening is that some admissions officer is trying to decide whether or not you're going to be successful in this program. But the only way in which we can featureize our applicants is by looking at things such as SAT scores, your GPA, your grade point average, uh, your recommendation letters, and so on. And so just using that collection of features, we're trying to decide the label, admit or not, which is really a proxy for whether or not you think you're, we're going to be successful in the program or not. Unsupervised learning is generally thought of as letting the data speak for itself. So we don't artificially impose labels. There are two types of unsupervised learning methods broadly. The first is clustering. Clustering attempts to partition our data into groups or clusters so that elements of the same group have much more similar feature vectors than elements in different groups. This relies on what's called metric information. So we need to figure out how to measure differences between our features. Generally speaking, this does not require probability, which we spent last week on. And I would say that clustering is really just the most primitive aspect of topology, which means that topological data analysis fits broadly into the expansion of unsupervised learning methods, something I hope to talk about by the end of the semester. Additionally, alongside clustering, there's dimensionality reduction. So often we'll take lots of features observed to several samples. For example, we might take someone's height, their weight, their blood pressure, um, their insulin levels, so on and forth and so on. But we might end up discovering that a lot of these attributes are actually correlated and therefore that all that data can be described using just a handful of parameters, perhaps in some unusual combination. This is a form of trying to find what's the true dimension of our 
space of samples as represented via the feature vectors. Some of you may have heard of this notion of the curse of dimensionality. We always try to hope that our data is actually described using some lower dimensional representation so that we can look at it and try to understand it. And the question you might ask yourself is, what does a human do with this low dimensional representation? And how might we use that to then engineer features that better represent uh, the data we're looking at? We're gonna go through this tree of machine learning methods. But of course, since our course only lasts so long, we'll only be able to handle a few of them. We already were able to look at one of the first aspects of supervised learning, which is regression. And today we're gonna to take up classification, looking at k-nearest neighbors and also linear classifiers. But that's just one aspect of machine learning. We have a whole tree of possibilities, which we'll hope to at least understand in broad strokes by the end of the semester. Okay, so let's look at our simplest version of classification. And again, we're now gonna assume that we have some understanding of geometry. In particular, we're gonna look at featureization, which allows us to actually visualize or study the data. So this featureization allows us to plot or treat each sample as some point in some potentially high dimensional vector space. But let's just imagine we are working with two features, two numerical features, which then allows us to plot each sample as a point in the plane. And now we're gonna think of the classification task as deciding which points are red points and which points are blue points. So let's look at a situation where we're given already some training data. And we're again, we're in a supervised learning situation. So that means we're already given some instances where the points have been colored for us. So here's an example, which was borrowed from Jake Van Der Plaas's Python Data Science Handbook. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, we've generated some synthetic data. This means that the computer generated it for us. This isn't anything that's real or came from an actual experiment. We've got some blue points and some red points. Now, suppose I were to give you a new instance, so a new sample, and I measure its two features. And suppose that point lands right where my cursor is. Would you think that that new point should be classified as a blue point or a red point? Well, if it is where I'm trying to point, you can see that it seems closer to blue points. And so things that are more similar somehow should belong together. We're gonna actually argue that what separates these two classes of points, blue points and the red points, is a, a single line or hyperplane in higher dimensions. This is the essence of a linear classifier. So let's look at that. So in this case, we've been able to find a line which separates all the blue points from all the red points. And what's illustrated here is the margin of this classifier, which means how far can we go to either side of this line before starting to run into either blue points or red points, which might be sort of our decision boundary for deciding whether or not a point belongs in the red cluster or the blue cluster. Again, we're not actually looking at clustering just yet. We're thinking of this as already labeled data. So, meaning it's labeled using its color. So mathematically, let's see how we would formulate linear classifiers. So in our two dimensions here, we were looking for a line, but in higher dimensions, we'll be actually looking for a hyperplane. So in three dimensions, it'd be a single plane, and in four dimensions, it'd be some whole three-dimensional subspace which separates are two classes of points. We're gonna just say these points are red and blue. Notice that in our train model predict paradigm, we're thinking of this is now our model. Our model is that we have two classes of, of points and that these are separated using some linear subspace, which we think of as a line or a hyperplane. Now, if you remember, if we're trying to, we're given a new instance, a new sample, and we're told its feature vector, which in two dimensions just consists of a pair of values, x comma y. 
and we can predict its class label by just deciding, by just observing which side of the line does this feature vector lie on. More generally, this is done in higher dimensions as follows. So in a linear classifier, what we do is we choose a vector n, which is our normal vector to our line. This is the normal again means sort of perpendicular. And that normal vector is what carves out our linear subspace L. Now, again, technically a linear subspace means it has to pass to the origin, but obviously you might need to not pass to the origin. So we have to have some displacement D. Mathematically, all this is modeled well using dot products. So suppose my model is that what separates red points and blue points is that when I take the dot product with the blue point, any blue point, again, which is represented using a vector with my normal vector D, I'm gonna assume that the blue points lie on the positive side of this plane. So they point in the direction N, which means that when I take the dot product, it's greater than D. This provides us with a decision procedure. I take a point, I look at its dot product within, and then I ask, is it greater than or less than D? So whenever I'm given a new feature vector, this means a new sample, a new instance of data. The rule is when I compute this dot product, if it's greater than D, I predict the label blue. And if it's less than D, then I predict the label red. And if I'm very unlucky and I get the dot product that's exactly equal to D, I could maybe just flip a coin because at that point, we're not confident in what our prediction is. Now, all of this is actually at the heart of a method called support vector machines is sometimes abbreviated SVM. This is a classic tool in artificial intelligence that's exists for decades. And we'll get into that in greater detail later in the semester. So remember, the model of learning that we're doing here is that we have to train, we have to model, we have to predict. Now, if you're given a collection of data, you don't wanna use all the data to train your model with because it's very expensive and labor intensive to go out and collect new data. So what we want to do is instead use a portion of our data, let's say 80%, and then use that to train or optimize our model on. And then we assess the quality of our model using the remaining 20% of data. This is sometimes called the 80-20 train test split. We use 80% of the data to train which in our case for a linear classifier, so that's how we're gonna choose our normal vector n and our displacement value d. And then for that remaining 20%, we assess how good our model is by then applying this decision, per decision procedure, taking the dot product with n and then comparing with the value d. So how do we actually assess the value or accuracy of our classifier? One of the fundamental tools for doing classification involves what's something called the confusion matrix, which essentially decides how confused is our model after we've trained it on our 80% of the data. Well, what we do in the case where we say have three classes, so instead of just having red points and blue points, I may have green points as well. So I've got red, blue, and green points. I develop some model, well, we can't really do it with a linear classifier because with only with three classes, we need a more complex decision rule. But with those, we then take dot products or do whatever our decision procedure is in order to see, was I correct or not in my prediction? For ones which I got correct, so in the case where I'm, let's say, just trying to separate uh, class one points from not class one points. For ones I got right, that goes into this light green box here. And for ones that I correctly said were not class one, so this is a way in which we can reduce, say, a, a three, class, class, three class classifier into a, just a binary classifier. Is it class one or not class one? That's where we have true positives and light green. And if we take a class two or a class three point in our rule, correctly decides that this is not class one, and we say that those are true negatives. And anything that's off the diagonal, so for example, we might have 
a class two point, which we predicted as class one. That's how to read this. We look at the actual value, and we know what the actual value is because we're looking at 20% of our data, which was already labeled for us, but we temporarily forgot the labels to see how good we could do. And so all these sort of pink squares here are instances where we messed up our classification using our model. And so the bottom line is we end up counting up all the ones we got wrong and also counting up all the ones we write. And then our accuracy is essentially just the number of true positives and true negatives divided by all these other cases where we made predictions on our data. All of this is a very complicated but slightly more refined way of saying something very simple, which is if I have some training data, I create a model, and then I want to test, I can just test it. I get it right or not using my classifier. The percentage of the time that I got it right, that's my accuracy. Okay. So we've gone over linear classifiers and I've already alluded to a situation where we might need to look at more than just red and blue points, say red, blue, and green, where I have three or more classes. So here's an example where, of a method which works on arbitrary number of classes. It's very simple, but it requires a little bit of geometry. And again, this being a graduate level course, I hope you're okay with this level of abstraction, but let's go through it in detail. So the next classifier after doing linear classification that we might consider is something called k-nearest neighbors. So it's actually a very, very simple classification, but it requires this notion of a metric. Metric is how we measure distances between feature vectors. But broadly speaking, a metric space is a set where I've given a collection of values associated to every pair of points, which tells me their distance. So we all want distances to satisfy the following three intuitive axioms. First of all, distances should be non-negative. Doesn't make sense to say that distance between two points is minus three miles. Who knows what that means? But one thing is certainly true is that we would like it to be the case that if I have two points and their distance is zero, I want them to actually be the same point. This is sometimes called the identity of indiscernibles. Of course, there are situations where all we can require is the implication that goes from the right to the left, meaning if two points are the same, obviously their distance from each other, from itself, is zero. You might have situations where two things actually have distance zero, but maybe are, sub are actually subtly different if you had more features to separate them. So that one's fairly intuitive. We just want distances from things to be zero if they're the same and not zero if they're not the same. We also want distances to be symmetric. For example, distance from me to you is 1,000 miles. The distance from you to me is also 1,000 miles. That's symmetry. We also want our metric to be what's called subadditive or satisfy what's called the triangle inequality. This just says that the distance from me to you is bounded from above by the distance from me to someone else, and then from that distance from that person to you. If this weren't true, it would be very unusual because somehow it's like I could go faster to you if I were to pass through a third person. That's just not something that we expect distances to satisfy. I've gone ahead and used some set theoretic notation. So this upside down A is the set theoretic symbol for all. What this says is that for all x, y, and z in our metric space, the distance from x to z is less than or equal to the distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z. So if you think about drawing a triangle with x, y, and z, this just says that one side of the triangle has to be less than or equal to the sum of the other sides of the triangle. Now, I already alluded to the fact that we might not have enough features to separate points. So another useful notion is something called a dissimilarity function. So this is non-negative, it's symmetric, um, and all we know is that the distance from a point to itself is zero, but it could be the case that two points which are actually different are distance zero from each other. So let me give you some examples of metrics that you maybe have seen. Of course, the most classical metric is one that we use in Euclidean geometry, 
which is if I have, let's say, two points in R2, then what I can do is take the sum of the squares of the distances in the x direction and y direction and then take the square root of that. So again, this just uses the Pythagorean theorem. There's actually more general versions of these metrics. Uh, these are sometimes called LP metrics. Our book, Gatog, calls this a Minkowski metric. And what the Minkowski metrics do is they generalize the Euclidean metric where I, instead of using two in the square root function, I use raise to the pth power and I take the pth root function. Turns out that sometimes using different values of p actually does a better job of separating data points. Of course, p equals two is the usual Euclidean metric, but there are also instances of things called, say, the taxi cab metric or the Manhattan distance, which basically says that my distance isn't computed just by how the crow flies, but rather how I can navigate there in a car. And if we're living on a grid, this means I have to take the sum of the blocks north and west or south and east in order to measure distances between two points. This uh, uh, metric was also something that we touched on earlier when we were doing some recursion. We talked about the edit distance. We talked about the hamming distance on strings. So here we just sum up the number of places in which something's different. So that was already an example of a more general metric. And I'll just note that sometimes machine, lear machine learning algorithms actually vary P as part of their optimization process in order to see if they get better separation of data using different metrics. There's also something called the L infinity metric, which if I've got an n-dimensional space, it just asks what's the largest direction in which they're different. So for example, if I have two points here in R2, one that's separated very far in the x direction, but only a little bit in the y direction, and their distance is that very far distance in the x direction. I don't even care about how far away they are on the y until that distance overcomes the other one. So why am I talking about metrics? Well, one of the paradigms of machine learning is that feature vectors should always be metrizable, meaning I should be able to compare people's featurizations in order to see how far apart they are, what's their distance. Distance was just made precise in the last slide. So, we're assuming always that our feature vectors actually belong to some metric space, which we treat as Rn, where n is the number of features that we're measuring. And sometimes it's okay if one of those directions seems like a categorical variable, and we could just use agreement or disagreement with that categorical, var that categorical variable with zero or one. So for example, how, I'm, how might I describe a person? Well, I could ask what's their political affiliation? Are they a Democrat? or are they a Republican? That gives me one feature. And if, the, if two samples disagree in that one coordinate, I just go ahead and say that's a distance of one. I could also ask, does this person rent or do they own? Again, if you disagree in that coordinate, I give you a one in my penalty function. And then I might also consider something like, what state do they live in? And if they both live in New York, then for example, I would say that distance in that direction is zero. So. If I were to then look at these two samples and measure their difference vector, I would get one, one, zero. And then I could use one of the LP norms I've just described in order to figure out how far they are. And again, that P is a parameter I could choose. P equals one, then I would just sum these two. And so that would give me a distance of two. But if I chose P equals two, I would get the square root of two. Square root of two is actually smaller than two, if you remember. And so that's an example of how choosing different metrics could separate these features a different amount, which might be important for our classification task. All right, so we now have all the background necessary to talk about the k-nearest neighbors algorithm. So again, this is a classifier algorithm. So I'm assuming I'm given some training data, which has labels. So how do I go about in deciding uh, how to predict so again, remember, we're training, we're modeling, and then we're predicting. In this case, we're predicting the label. And for a classification task, 
we're predicting a label which has only finitely many possible values. So how would I predict if I'm given a collection of labeled points? K nearest neighbors algorithm, which is sometimes called KNN, operates as follows. So I've taken my samples, which I've already identified with their corresponding feature vectors. And I'm assuming those feature vectors can be compared using a metric. So all that is to say, I've got my features and they belong in some metric space. I'm assuming these samples, again, represented using their feature vectors, have been given a set of labels. So for example, maybe I pick some metrics for my pictures, which, and then I said which ones were cats or dogs. So you'll notice that in k nearest neighbors, there's a parameter called k. This k is some integer that's greater than zero. And this essentially just counts the number of neighbors we're gonna look at in order to assess or predict the value of a label for a new point. So how does this prediction process work? Well, I, what I first do is I, I've given a new test sample represented using its feature vector. That's why I use this boldface T. And then I look at the set of the K closest points. And again, closeness is now measured using our metric. So I basically take my new test point, I look at all the points in my training data, I measure the distances, and then I sort those values from smallest to largest. And now I look at the K closest points. So this gives me a subset of my training data, which is K, at least as measured according to T, where T is our test sample. And then what I do is I reveal the labels in my training data of those K points, and I count up all their labels. And I think of these as votes. And then whatever the majority decides is the, uh, whichever is the majority label, that's the thing which I assign as a label to my new point, T. So for example, if I had just red and blue points and I picked three for my value of K, and given a new sample, I would look at the three closest points and then I would count up how many red points and how many blue points are there in those three. And so whichever one is the majority, that is the value or predicted label for my new test sample. So we've done enough programming now where you can imagine how this code might actually work. So I encourage you to take some time to go through and read this code in detail. First of all, here I've got some pseudocode where this is actual code with some comment where I'm looking at the finding the K nearest um, with my example set and I'm looking at my test point and I'm also giving you the value K because that's necessary to decide how many points I'm looking at. And then I just go ahead and I construct a list of distances and I have to do some sort of uh, sort process in order to find the closest. So I encourage you all to take some time to read through this code and try to decide what is the complexity of the above algorithm. So once we've gone through and found the K closest, you can then define your K nearest neighbors classifier algorithm as being the one which takes those K nearest and then just counts up and sees how many points had a given label. And then we can compare that to what this actual label was, assuming that this data point is from some 20% reserved data where we can then test how good our classifier is. And of course, doing this whole thing, which checks for the majority, and then if it disagrees, we can augment either true positives or false positives, or true negatives, or false negatives. And then this all gets returned as a list, actually a tuple. True positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives. So this assesses the, the quality of our class. So that code works perfectly well using some of the most basic uh, 
data types already provided by Python, namely lists. But we've already started using NumPy and taking advantage of some of its implementations of data structures such as arrays. In particular, one of the reasons which NumPy is preferred over the classical built-in data types like lists is that actually the sort process can be done much faster using a NumPy array rather than a Python list. I encourage you to read a little bit from von der Plas in order to uh, get a feeling for why these things are different. So we're gonna go ahead and just take advantage of scikit-learn's already built-in k-nearest neighbors classifier. But I provided that code from GoodTog in order for you to have a deeper sense of how this algorithm works sort of under the hood. We're gonna illustrate this data on a biological data set. And I wanna provide a quick comment of uh, differences in taxonomy as pioneered by Aristotle and then later turned on its head by Darwin. And this is what we sometimes call Darwin's marvelous idea. I wanna thank Cheyenne Mukherjee at Duke University for opening me up to this perspective on Darwin's contributions. So for some historical context, Aristotle was in some sense a philosopher, but also one of the first scientists. And he was a student of Plato. And one of the things that Plato believed, since he believed in the immortality of the soul and knowledge being acquired when the soul is separate from the body, was this notion of forms. These are sort of idealized aspects of things. Uh, for Plato, there was such a thing as a, an ideal horse or an ideal chair. And that, in fact, when we are out in the world, the way we recognize as horses or chairs is that our soul remembered what an ideal horse looked like or an ideal chair looked like. Aristotle, although departed from Plato by looking at actual features out in the world, he still believed that there was this notion of some absolute quantity. And in fact, part of the reason why Aristotle believed in trying to come up with some true, truly defined taxonomy is that somehow these should be aspects that were somehow absolute. And so Aristotle used a class, of, a, a method of categorization, which tried to find the sort of platonic ideals of each of these animals or creatures and sort in order to use that to compare them and separate them. So in that sense, there was always an ideal which Aristotle was after. This sort of ideal, uh, again, works really well in mathematics, but not so well in biology, because in mathematics, obviously we have notions of what a perfect square is or a perfect circle, even though there are no perfect squares or circles out in reality. But in some sense, this belief in perfection uh, held back science because Aristotle in, sen in some sense was looking for some uh, pure unchanging notion which separated all these creatures. But Darwin completely departed from that idea as did some others, but Darwin is sort of the one who gets the most credit for it. Of course, Darwin was catching on to the idea of evolution by natural selection at the same time that a competitor, Alfred Russell Wallace was. And in fact, this attempt to sort of beat one another to the punch is what finally motivated Darwin to publish his ideas. Darwin really departed from Aristotle in that he believed that actually variation was a natural process and that in fact, these categories would blur over time and that there was no such thing as a platonic horse. In fact, there's just sort of a horse at this moment in time, um, again, being subjected to the influences of selection. And this way in which these categories sort of merged or divided or split it was what led Darwin to this notion of the tree of life, which he then realized would lead one to believe that there is perhaps a common ancestor which relates all of life. This was a pretty radical notion at the time, especially given that it contracted, contradicted a lot of religion. And Aristotle had already been co-opted by the Christian church as sort of foundations for its teachings. So Darwin really believed in variation and he looked at sort of features and saw that you could actually separate and make the conclusion that perhaps these creatures or species had a common ancestor. Now, this is not to say that platonic thought and Darwin's thoughts are actually incompatible, but 
in some sense, you don't want to look, look at these sort of absolute qualities. Instead, you want to look at something more genetics based. Um, and you can think of life as sort of exploring uh, these sort of feature space. And that all this is to say is that math might still be a really good model for all these things. All right, so that's some philosophical context, but now let's look at a data set which could not be separated well with the linear classifier, in part because there are sort of three classes of things that we're looking at, but actually was very well separated using k-nearest neighbors. And this is sometimes called the, the uh, Iris or Fisher data set. So Ronald Fisher was a really influential statistician, um, and he was interested in the, in the following problem. And he paired, paired up with a, a researcher uh, in Quebec, actually not far from here in Albany, New York, where they were interested in measuring these different irises and looking at particular features. Uh, the two features that uh, uh, Fisher's collaborator Anderson looked at was uh, sort of these petal length and width, and also stamen uh, width and length. Either way, these three irises, although they look very similar, are obviously different. And the question is, if I were just to give you an instance, how would you actually separate and determine which class does our observed iris belong to? Assuming it belongs to one of these three classes of iris, iris setosa, iris versicolor, and iris virginica. So this iris data set, again, back in the 30s, so big data really wasn't a thing. So we were given 50 samples of irises. And for each of these, we looked at sepal length and petal length, as well as their widths. So that means we had four features, the sepal width and length, the petal width and length. Now, this was a very interesting data set because iris setosa clearly wouldn't clearly fall in one cluster, would, call, would fall into one cluster, but uh, the other ones wouldn't. And in, and in fact, Fisher really liked this data set because it showed that linear methods were not sufficient to separate them. In fact, this data set is so famous that it's built inside of uh, one of our packages for doing machine learning, which is called Scikit-Learn. And in fact, if you look at this other report repository for data sets, you look at you all data sets, oops. You can see that the most popular data set since 2007 is this IRIS data set with a number of downloads, uh, almost twice as many as uh, the next one. So this UC Irvine machine learning repository is a great selection of classical data sets, which we can use to try to understand machine learning methods on. Of course, another perhaps more modern implementation of this uh, is Kaggle. And Kaggle includes a lot of uh, examples of, has built-in Jupyter notebooks that allow you to classify and separate these three species of virus. But in fact, we can actually use uh, both pandas and uh, just this built-in functionality of Python. to Go ahead and pull in uh, the iris data set from our UC Irvine uh, website. Do that using our URL. And you'll see here that I can go ahead and define my data set where I populated what the columns are uh, using sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and class. This is all following a uh, presentation on stackabuse.com. So here I have my pandas function, which reads in a CSV file. It's something we touched on briefly in the last lecture, but we'll go into it in more detail next week where we're interested in where the data comes from, which in this case, it's just hosted on the server. Now we've gone ahead and given the names. You'll notice that a default variable is used. We've gone ahead and passed it the values up above. So just get a sense of how these data sets are viewed in Python, um, specifically when viewing pandas. You'll notice that if you look at the attribute of columns, which is expressed using dataset.columns, we get exactly the names we just gave. All right, so let's go ahead and try to extract out some of the data, but not looking at the class. You know, we'll see that 
we're going to use this dot loc attribute and then we're going to look at our columns that are not equal to class right, so let's get a sense of what x looks like so you'll see here that pandas provides a really nice visualization um, in particular it's pre-populated our column headings using sepal length sepal width petal length and petal width and even though there's supposed to only be 50 um, samples here, going ahead and telling us that there's actually 150 rows here. Let's not worry about that for the moment. All right, so what happens when we, uh, when we go ahead and look at, let's say the class label. So meaning I've got my samples, which are numbered zero through 149, means I have 150 samples. And I'm gonna extract out this value y. y is going to actually be our, our class labels. You'll see here that it, it's already linearly sorted, where I've got all the iris setosas, and then at the end I have all the iris virginicas. So that means iris versa color is somewhere in between. So now we're going to perform this 80-20 test split. So here what we've gone in is given a tuple of arguments, done our train test split, and we've said our test size is only going to be 20. So that means our train size is 80%. All right, so again, luckily we've extracted out 80% of the training data and it's done it via some randomized algorithm. And we, that has the useful feature that it's all mixed up all these different types of viruses. We can just get a sense of what this looks like. So what this means is that we've extracted out 120 samples from our larger data set of 150 samples. And we now have encoded each of those samples using this four-dimensional vector, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Of course, we can't see into four dimensions, but luckily K-nearest neighbors doesn't require that we see. We could just make these decisions automatically. So the way that's done, we're gonna bring in sklearn, our neighbors algorithm, and then we import in particular K neighbor, K neighbors classifier. So I'm gonna go ahead and use K equals three, which is encoded using N neighbors. And so we'll notice that the scikit-learn API goes ahead and provides this notion of fit in our train model predict paradigm. So we're going to fit our classifier, which is an instance of the K neighbors classifier class. I'm going to update my attributes using this fit function using X train and Y train. So again, X train just consists of those four features: iris, um, the sepal petal, sepal and petal width and length, along with what the those labels are. And I've gone ahead and chosen our Minkowski metric which is one of the reasons why I brought that up. And you can see here that P equals two. So that means we're using Euclidean distance. So now that we've got a classifier object, we can then predict the Y labels using our test data set. So that's our remaining 20%. And so finally, we can assess the quality of our K nearest neighbors classifiers. You can see Last time I ran this, got an accuracy of 97%. Let's see if that happens again here. So again, because all these algorithms are sort of randomly seeded, let's see that in this iteration, I got a 93% accuracy, which is really remarkable if you think about it. We don't even need our human eyes, we just need someone to go ahead and collect some features, and then we can teach a computer to automatically predict what species Iris we're looking at just based on those four attributes. And with those four attributes and the K nearest neighbors algorithm, we have a 93% accuracy in predicting iris species. So as we just saw, it went from 97% last time to 93% uh, with our accuracy here. And that's our classifier score. Now, one other common thing is why don't we let K vary? So meaning instead of just looking at the three closest neighbors, let's look at the closest four or five or six, all the way up to 30. And let's plot the accuracy as a function of K. 
And we actually see that for this particular iteration, um, k equals three actually did give us our best accuracy, at least when we looked at the testing. But there were also a lot of ones that tied just as well. And in fact, looking at 11 through 20 neighbors gave us equally good performance. Um, our training accuracy is also one where we kind of flip around these and then determine whether or not our classifier did a good job. And you can see that that actually kind of goes down as k gets larger. All right, so I know this was a lot for today, but in summary, classification is considered with concerned with the task of predicting labels that lie in some discrete set. In this case, we're looking at iris species. We looked at two types of classifiers. We looked at linear classifiers and the k nearest neighbor classifier, both of which are very commonly used um, in our sort of fundamental examples of classification methods using machine learning. I look forward to seeing you all in class.